guess we'll get started then. Uh, our next speaker today is Taras Gleck. Uh, he's a static analysis hacker at Mozilla and spends most of his time on C++ static analysis and refactoring tool chains that can do a lot of the large-scale mechanical C++ tasks for him. So we're very excited to hear more about those. So I'm a Mozilla hacker that hacks on GCC and everything else that's not related to Mozilla. It's kind of a cool job. Um, so I'm going to start out with this slide. So I believe that we are in a stone age of software development right now. Um, our tools have sort of stayed the same since the 70s. Um, we've got new languages. But there hasn't been any breakthroughs uh, to solve like the, what, what I consider to be the fundamental problem of software development. Um, so, so writing code is sort of like digging your so You start out writing a program. It's about 100 lines long. You understand exactly what your program does. You need to make a bug fix to it. Well, you know what your program does. So you make your bug fix, and you're done, or add a new feature. Um, but unfortunately, the way software development works is when you, as you add new things to the program, the code keeps growing and growing. And uh, as, the, as that code is growing, the developer leverage is, sh is shrinking. So over time, you, you, you're doomed, because you end up not, not, not knowing what your code does anymore. So what I propose is that we use static analysis tools to sort of increase the developer leverage to, 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 to stop the event, to so, sort of slow down the eventual uh, doom, doom where you can't con control, your so control your software anymore. So here's a little diagram that that's the best I can do. Um, so there are these, as a Firefox developer, this, this is sort of how I see the world. There's the web on top of me, and under me there's the compiler and the operating system. And even though we're all open source, there's very little communications being done between the two. Uh, I know Linus is always complaining about GCC. Um, we're always complaining about GCC. The web developers. We're always pushing features onto them instead of them asking for a particular feature. Um, there are exceptions to th these rules. Uh, but even though we're open source, it seems that there's too little communication going on. Like, we're all open source projects. So I'm, as a Mozilla hacker, I can contribute to GCC. I can contribute to the Linux, Linux kernel, uh, et cetera. Um, so I think the next fundamental breakthroughs are going to come through this collaboration. Uh, we need to have more sort of more c communication about requirements from pr applications such as Firefox onto GCC, or from Firefox into the kernel, uh, etc. So, what is static analysis? Um, I think static analysis sort of has a bad bad reputation for itself. It's viewed as some sort of exotic, academic pursuit. Um, but essentially what static analysis is, you treat your code as a data structure. That's all. I mean, I think it's criminal that we, we write all this code and it's treated as a, as, a, as a text file. There's absolutely no reason for that. The compiler looks at the code, it has these nice data structures, so then it can do all this stuff, uh, such as optimize it, et cetera. But when we actually comes to writing our code, we have to use grep and sed for uh, any, any sophisticated task we want to do. So I want to find where there's a particular method in my code. Well, I use a... Uh, C tags if I'm lucky, uh, but even C tags uses a pretty primitive parser, so it won't be able to find anything useful about the code. Um, so what can static analysis do right now? Um, you guys probably know about Coverity, Sparse. Um, I don't know, how many people here are C++ developers? Oh, great. This is my biggest audience for this yet. Um, have you, how many people use the static analysis tools? So which ones were using Coverity? Um, okay, sparse. <laughs> Is there any any other tools that are? Clang. Clang. Okay. So, Correct. Correct. <laughs> Great. Um, so so this is like the, the traditional static analysis. Um, I think Clang is doing the same thing sort of as Coverity, where there's all these um, baked-in analyses for common bugs, and these are really hard to write because you're looking, you're trying to model every every single program out there. Um, so you're, try, you're basically trying to find bugs in the language specification. So say in C++, it's really easy to dereference de a pointer that's, a, that's actually a null. So you look for bugs like that. And that's actually pretty hard to find. Um, my goal at Mozilla has been to look at static analysis in another way. Um, we want to do a lot more application-specific analyses. These are really easy to write. 
and they're a lot more effective because they can be specific to our APIs. We can control exactly how our APIs are used. So once you write a particular API, do an analysis for it, you can be pretty sure that people don't abuse it too much, which is pretty hard right now. Um, you can also do things like generating bindings. So everybody here probably knows of SWIG. Um, and how many people found SWIG to be insufficient for their needs? Okay. Um, are you guys KDE hackers? Smoke? Okay. So, so it seems to me that every time somebody tries to write a binding with SWIG, they try using SWIG, they find that it can't parse their particular code, and then they move on to write their own parse, their own generator for the binding. And, you know, their own generator doesn't end up being as, as useful as, it doesn't end up being general purpose, so nobody builds on that work. Um, so with, with a static analysis framework, you can just plug into the compiler, see exactly what the code means, and generate your own binding. Um, so you, you sort of get the best of both worlds. You can parse your code perfectly, and since, uh, since in, this, in my framework, it's, uh, you can just specify your, your, your scripts in JavaScript, you can just specify exactly how your bindings are gonna be generated, and I'll show an example of this. Um, you can also visualize the code base, which is really nice, because in Mozilla, um, it's really hard to even find where a particular method is in your code. So now we can actually build a UI where you can figure out exactly the path from one method to another, which is too hard in C++ normally. And uh, so we also have this morbid fascination with dead code at Mozilla. And a lot of people say, well, dead code, that's not, that's not very interesting because the compilers will find the dead code for you. But it turns out that for a compiler to, find, to, to flag a piece of code as dead, it has to be in a very peculiar version of dead code. So for example, if I have a virtual method, it will never ever be flagged as dead code by the compiler because that method might be used by something else. So what you really want is you want to have a report about your, about your code base of things that are potentially dead, but that should all be reviewed by a human. Um, and I think Mozilla has a lot of dead code being an old, an old, uh, an old program. I think I found, the first time I tried it, I, I deleted a few thousand lines of code and uh, like a whole component of Mozilla turned out to be not used. Um, it was a component that we were sent, that there were a bunch of patches in their view queue for. People are fixing code that was never being run. I mean, it was a ridiculous waste of engineering effort. And there's no way to tell which parts of your code base are dead. Um, it's just, it's, it's an extremely uh, unusual problem to solve. Yeah, but I mean, like, the, the problem with code coverage is that uh, code coverage, um, when you're generating code coverage tests, um, the, the test suite cost is exponential with all the parameters. So the permutations of that are not really suitable for deleting code. Yeah. But I mean, that's, that's one way to, to do it. So why did we build this on GCC? Well, it turns out C++ is an impossibly hard language to parse. Like, it takes two years for an extremely smart person to write a parser that, that barely works. Um, the, 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 it's, a, it's, an, it's, it's an ambiguous grammar. Uh, there, so you have to like instantiate all your types before you can parse part of the source code. So you actually, there's actually a feedback loop from the, from the, uh, from the type system into the uh, lexer, which is ridiculous. Um, so GCC is sort of the de facto standard C++ compiler. There's nothing else in Linux that compiles C++ that is open source. Um, there are some alternatives. There's LLVM Clang, which I think is a great project, but I think it's also about a year or two from being useful for C++. Um, there's ELSA, which can actually parse Mozilla, but unfortunately, ELSA is a very nice academic project, but it doesn't have a compiler backend on it. So sure, you can parse Mozilla, but hey, uh, is, the, is, the, is the, your AST actually correct? Is there anything, like, is there any bugs in there? You don't know. So you make all these analyses, analyses on top of a framework that's not actually um, guaranteed to be correct. Uh, so, so I started out with ELSA initially, because there's this big, uh, this, this rumor that GCC was the hardest, worst code base of a, you, you, you'll ever ex experience. As soon as you touch GCC, you'll just be suicidal or something. Um, so, but I tried out ELSA, and I was like, you know, this is not working out. I'm going to try the, the next best thing, GCC. That's the only other option left. And it turned out that, was, that actually works, works out really well. Um, so GCC 4.5 is, to me, the most exciting release ever because it allows for plugins. What plugins do is, is it means for the first time ever you can put your own code inside of, G, inside of GCC and you can do whatever you like. So before this, uh, Stallman was afraid of opening up, opening up the compiler this way um, because then somebody would write a proprietary extension to it and proprietary optimization and sell that and you know, GCC, the whole point of GCC would be lost because you would have the front end and somebody else would be abusing it for a proprietary game. Um, 
but that, I think that I think that fear proved to be unreasonable, given that all the progress that he was stopping from the open source world from that. So there were all these frameworks for uh, writing plugins for GCC that were out of tree that could not land because of license reasons, basically. So as of GCC 4.4, uh, they changed the license to allow plugins. And in GCC 4.5, they actually added the API for them. Um, and there's a bunch of really r ridiculous rules in there where you have to say, you have to make a symbol that says this code is GPL. <laughs> I mean, I think Linux has a similar problem with, with uh, modules now. Um, so in addition to that, it's gonna, um, GCC 4.5 is going to have link time optimizations. It's a really big step for the compiler. So some of the plugins that are going to appear as soon as GCC 4.5 ships, which was supposed to be a month ago, um, I'm guessing it's... <laughs> yeah. Um, so some of the plugins that we're going to see, we're going to see my plugins, the Hydras. LLVM is working on uh, you, reusing the GCC front end as a plugin. Like right now, they have a patch for GCC that you can install to use LLVM. And there's another plugin called Milepost, which is basically a um, brute force uh, optimization generator for GCC. It just brute forces all the different uh, optimization flags to produce the optim optimization configuration for your code. It's really cool. So what are the GCC? So after switching to GCC from ELSA, I, I was really amazed by how, how well suited GCC is for static analysis. This is something the code base was never intended for. So GCC has these things called attributes, which are really cool because you can attach these attributes to almost any part of the code. So if you ever want to annotate something for your analysis, you can always stick an attribute in there. And that's not even that's not part of the C++ spec, and the C++ 0x is actually going to have something similar, but apparently it's not nearly as good. Um, their syntax is a little ambiguous. Um, GCC also has this thing called the Pass Manager, which is a really a really modern feature for it because uh, GCC was never structured as a proper compiler. It was sort of a let's write a compiler and see what happens. Um, so like if you, if you if you read a compiler textbook and then you look at GCC code, you'll go what the hell. Um, so for the last couple of years, GCC ha hackers have actually been modifying GCC to look more like a real compiler, which I think is a little ironic. Um, but what it also has is this thing called Gimple. I'm going to try to pop up and see if it's visible on the screen. So C++ uh, is a really annoying language to analyze. There's a lot of sort of syntactic sugar. There's a lot of side effects going on. Um, so if you're doing analyses with an LLVM or ELSA, usually they're, they're done on a really low level, on a really high level C++, so exactly as it comes in from the parser, um, that's sort of the C++ that you try to analyze. And then it has way too much detail for your code to handle. So what GCC does is they have this Gimple language, which looks a lot like C. It's actually, a, I think it's sort of like a simplified version of C. But it also has a, a few features that C doesn't have to support languages such as C++ or Objective-C or Java. Um, so here's an example of code base, a, a little class. You can see all the implicit stuff that GCC generates. So you can see all the temporary variables that I added. Um, the, the constructor initiation, that, that just gets translated. Uh, you can see that this uh, parameter is explicit. It's all very, it's very useful for analysis because now instead of analyzing C++, you're basically analyzing C, which is a lot easier to model in your head. So any, any questions about this part? Okay. Okay, so, so this is the fun part. Uh, the hydras are my plugins that I wrote, uh, and I thought, I was reading all these um, papers about static analysis, and every single person was writing this crazy uh, domain-specific language for them. And domain-specific languages are really nice because you can fit the language specifically to your problem. But the problem is, as soon as you try to do something that the author didn't envision, you have to extend the language. And I also don't really, didn't feel like writing my own language, runtime, etc. So I decided, wouldn't it be funny if I put SpiderMonkey into GCC and we'll be able to run JavaScript in GCC? You know, it seems like a great idea. What could go wrong, right? Um, so I thought it was funny for a while, but then I realized that that's actually, it's actually a, a really, it's, a, it's an interesting way to do analysis. So what is uh, JavaScript? JavaScript is a language that sort of looks like C, but it also has a lot of the features of Lisp. So you have garbage collection, you have easy to, you, you have easy to define data structures. You're not going to segfault your compiler from having a mistake in your analysis. Um, 
your analysis is going to be a lot more concise than any C or C++ analysis. So, you know, it's possible to write something in five lines of code, which is usually not possible in C++. Um, and it's, you know, because, because you have all these first-class functions, you can do recursive functions, you can do, you can do all these nice things that are more painful in C, in C or C++. Um, So this is my first tool, it's called Dehydra. And uh, the first question people ask me is not what it does, but how does it, what the hell does that mean? What is Dehydra? Um, so I was trying to come up with a name that was Googleable, so I wanted something unique. Uh, but I figured, so I, I wrote this, um, I generated a control flow graph once of a function that was giving me trouble. And I'm gonna pop that out so it's more visible. So basically, every, every uh, piece of code, before you want to analyze it, you want to break it, break it into a control flow graph. And a control flow graph basically, basically takes uh, all the control flow out of your function uh, and organizes it as a, as a, as a number of blocks that are, that are sequential, and, there's a, and these are the branches between them. So to me, that sort of reminds me of the Hydra monster. So dehydra is sort of a way of taming the Hydra monster. Uh, so you, know, you chop off its heads as you analyze each one. So my goal with Dehydra was to make a really simple uh, beginner static analysis tool that, that can still do a lot of useful analyses. Um, so I tried to keep it as minimal as possible. We did not add features that we did not immediately use in Mozilla. So every time we need a new, new feature, we would, look, we would take a hard look at Dehydra and be like, well, can I already do this with another feature, or do I really need a new feature? Um, so this allowed, to, allowed us to keep the API fairly minimal and understandable to beginners, I hope. Um, and we have... We have, we have documentation for this tool. It's, it should be the nicest, the easiest to use static analysis tool uh, that I've ever seen, at least. Um, so it builds on the, on the JavaScript strength, like uh, the JSON-like syntax. Um, so when you do an eval of an AST, uh, you get this JSON-like object. And the difference between JSON and this an eval AST is uh, JSON does not allow you to have um, cycles in your tree. And this does. And, all programming, uh, all programming languages usually have cycles in the ASC. So this is very useful for that. And I'm going to show some examples of these scripts in, in a little bit. And then I have uh, TreeHydra, which is a direct JavaScript binding to, to GCC's Gimple. Um, so it looks a lot like C without actually being C. I think that's the best part of it. So you can do everything you want to do in C, but you, get rid of, you just don't, don't mention the type names. And you, you can treat functions as first-class functions. Um, it runs fast because we have a JavaScript JIT, so it's, you don't actually notice any slowdown from using JavaScript over C. And it allows you to, to do some fairly sophisticated analyses that would be a lot trickier to implement in a low-level like, low language like C, um, just because of, you, know, you don't crash as much. So I'm going to show an example of what, what I mean by looks like C. So on the left is the function that I took out of GCC, and we have to port it to, to, to TreeHydra. So on the right is the same function in JavaScript. Um, you can see that the part around the while loop looks a lot like the, can you see this code? Yeah, so sorry, my, my laptop doesn't want to do high enough resolution for this. Um, so basically, the main difference um, this is slightly different in this code because it works on multiple versions of the GCC. So because JavaScript is dynamic, we can see is this feature present uh, and then sort of fudge our way to make the API work on multiple versions of GCC, um, whereas in a compiled program would not, not allow us to do that. It's a bit of a hack, but that's, um, the GCC AST is not a stable AST, so we hope that it, basically with, with TreeHatter, you hope that it doesn't change too much. But at the same time, it's a trade-off versus not being able to do static analysis or having to change your scripts with every release. So I think it's a reasonable trade-off. So that's why there's a little difference in that index subtraction there. Um, but other than that, all you do is you just take out, take out the type of the variable and stick in a let instead. So like I said, this, this allows uh, sort of more traditional 
uh, static analyses. So you can you can look for null pointer dereferences, etc. So back to the original question: Why is the browser vendor hacking GCC? I mean, it's cool that I get to do that, but what's the what's the point of this? Um, well. I mean, I'd like to ask the same question. Why, why aren't there any static analysis tools available already? I mean, we've had compilers for, a lot, for many years, and yet the compilers always hide the, the internals from the user. Um, apparently, there were some languages which actually store the code in the binary format, um, but I've never used any of those languages. Um, so Mozilla has a big code base, and humans don't really scale to millions of lines of code. And we're trying to uh, speed up our development cycle, so we're trying to be more aggressive with new features. And as you... As you become more and more aggressive about your features, you need to increase developer leverage. You need to make sure that when you introduce a new feature, you do not break the existing code base. Um, like you, you have to move forward because there's all these other browsers right now, um, and but we we can't stop and, and rewrite our code base just like when Mozilla 1.0 happened. I don't know. I think that took three to four years, maybe five. It's not a reasonable release cycle anymore. Um, but the underlying so code bases like GCC are open source, so we can just modify GCC to our needs to get the analysis that we need to increase the developer leverage. So here's another slide on this. So we have 1.7 million lines of C++. We have another million lines of JavaScript. And it's like I said, we're constantly changing. So uh, as one of the projects that we tried to do, uh, in Mozilla we have these uh, reference counted smart pointers. And we figured, you know, there's a fair bit of overhead to uh, reference counting. Why don't we switch to our garbage collector? So I, I, we wrote this, um, I wrote, a, on top of Elsa, I wrote a refactoring engine that generated three megabyte patches that changed every single pointer in, uh, in, in, in Mozilla from a smart pointer to a raw pointer, um, and then changed all, all the code that used that pointer. And the patches were really great. They were like six megs in size. And you apply them and they compile. It was amazing. <laughs> Uh, but it turned out as you apply these patches, you also start muting all kinds of analysis to make sure that as you change the code, certain invariants still hold. So the header came out of that effort. Um, and it was really cool. So we, we had these two parallel branches of development. We had all the normal Mozilla developers committing to the Mozilla repository. And then we had me and two other people. I was writing the tools, and the other people were telling me what to do and then testing my patches. And uh, so, so we had this two, two repositories set up. There was the Mozilla Central. And then there was the uh, you know garbage collected Mozilla, and we synced that we synced it over every every week or two. So every week or two we, we would generate a brand new six megabyte patch, apply it, <laughs> run it, and test it. It was fantastic. But unfortunately, the garbage collector that we were using turned out to be not good enough for our needs, so we had to scrap the project. But it was a uh, yeah, it, it would have been really cool. This would have been like the biggest refactoring ever. I mean, when when you change you know a million lines of code, it's awesome. I think we changed like every function in Mozilla. Okay, so while I was writing Dehydra, I was constantly complaining on my blog. C++ is incredibly hard to navigate. I mean, you op you look at a function in C++ and you're like, where is that implemented? It could be virtual. You could have it could be an overloaded method. It, it could be loaded as a plugin at runtime. There's really no way to tell unless you just grab for six hours. So, hopefully this, this will show up. So David Humphrey wrote, wrote this tool, which is a uh, sort of a de derivative of LXR and the MXR. Have you guys used LXR? Okay. So LXR is a, I think it's a very frustrating tool. It's, it's like a grep. It doesn't really add a lot more to, to your um, experience other than being, being able to link to various pieces of code in your online conversations. So this is a slightly different. It's, it's sort of like, just like LXR, but it has semantic information. I mean, here I'm searching for a class, and there it shows me that there's actually a type called by that, by that name. So I can click on that type. Wow, this is fast. Um, so this takes me to, the, to, to, the, to where the type is defined. It gives me all of the mem members in the class. And this is actually really interesting. So you can see all these methods in the class. But if you click on them, they're all hidden in this macro. So if I were using graph, I wouldn't even see this. So if I was looking for this method, I was like, where is this defined? When I was a new, new Mozilla developer, it was really frustrating. I'd be looking for a, for a method that's supposedly defined in a particular file, 
but it's not showing. Like you can't search for it. So this understands macros because we, we just see the code the way the compiler does it. Um, so you can actually, you, you can see exactly what you're hiding by macros. Uh, you can also do things like this. You're like, what, what is this parent class over here? Oh, look, it's defined over here in, the, in an IDL file. It has these members. It's derived from an SI supports. And these are all the classes that, that are derived from it. So, you know, some tools like Eclipse give you some of this functionality. Most of them don't scale to the size of Mozilla. Um, since we build, build this functionality into the compiler, it will basically expose all this information uh, to every single editor that wants to use it. So I'm hoping to eventually have this database downloadable into an Emacs format. So every time you look for something in, in, a, in Emacs, it would actually use a proper semantic database and go to exactly, go to exactly where you're looking for. Um, and of course, this also does other features. Like you can switch between uh, implementation and uh, definition. So this goes, this goes to the declaration, and that goes to the definition. It's really fun. Um, this, this saves me like hours per day on Mozilla. And then we have a slightly more advanced feature. Oh, come on. So another common problem with C++ is um, there's a lot of methods that are named the same thing because you have an object that differs, but the method is still named the same thing. So that renders grep useless. Uh, for example, there's a very common method used in, in many programs called toString. But say if you're working on a two-string implementation, you wonder who calls it, you have really no way to find out all the call sets of that method without some, some ugly hacks. So you either like rename the method and look for compiler errors, <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, probably the most, that was the most frequent method of refactoring Mozilla before this. Um, or you write a tool like this, and then you can actually look for, write a query that says, Give me all the colors of this particular method, and that will filter out all the useful, all, all of the exact methods that you're looking for. So that was done by David Humphrey in Canada. He's a, a fantastic guy. So these are some of the, some of the analysis that we did in Mozilla. Um, these are landed, we've landed these analysis in our, in our um, nightly build integration system. So every time you compile, um, these analysis show up, uh, either throw up errors or warnings, or, or they produce some nice little graph show, for documentation purposes. So the first one is a final. Really, it's a really simple uh, script to, to implement fi the final keyword in, in C++. So in Java, you have this final keyboard, keyword, where you can say, this class is final. You can't override this anymore. Um, Turns out that's a really fun analysis to do in Dehydra. I'm going to show you the source code for this. Can you see this okay? Okay. How's that? So this is a dehider. This is one of the first analyses that we did. Um, you basically have a callback called process type, which is called for every single type in, in, that the compiler sees. Um, you just look, you, you look if, if that type is a, if that type is an enum or a, or a class. In this particular case, we're looking if it's a class. If it's a if it's a class or a struct, and it's a complete one, we look if it has if it has a final tag, and then we see it, then we check sorry we check if the parent of it has a final final tag attached to it final attribute, and if there's a final attribute, we produce an error. That's a, that's a final class you can't derive from it. So that's what that's like ten lines of code maybe. We just added a brand new feature to C plus plus. Oops. 
we have a similar, um, similar, similar analysis for uh, control flow. So in, in a lot of C code especially, but it's also present in C++, you have go-to labels. And every once in a while, you have a go-to label that says, that, that's the label that does all the cleanup in my code. And every once in a while, you accidentally stick a, stick a return statement above it, and that cleanup doesn't run. So you leak memory, et cetera. So we added the little, really simple feature. We said, uh, you put a, if there's a particular branch of code that, that, causes, that forces the code to, to exit through a particular uh, label, we say code must flow through this label. Let's see. So in this case, um, assume, so this, this, is, this was done for the SpiderMonkey program, uh, SpiderMonkey JavaScript engine. So we have a lot of really large methods. And if a certain condition is triggered, that, that means that we later have to clean up. So you can do this. You can, go, you can go into an if statement. Once you're in that if statement, you say, you know, now the code that, that touched this line should always exit through, through this out label. And uh, so what the analysis does is it runs through all the possible paths in that method, and it says, do they all run through the out label? And in this case, they do. Any, any questions about this? OK. There's a question over there. OK. I'll show you that. So um, I, I was talking about C++ attributes. I was just asking, how do you um, apply the, what you want, the rules inside the C++ code? Yeah, that's fine. One second, let me show you. Let me show you the test case for this. So these are these uh, GCC attributes that I was talking about. So this sort of looks like Java. We add a, we add a macro to, um, to, to, to our code base that says NS final class. When you compile your code with static check and yawn, this macro ex expands the GCC attribute. And that, that the attribute can say anything. In this case, it says user final. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. So, so basically, we, we can extend the syntax. And with macros, we can uh, turn, turn, turn the macros on and off, depending whether we're using plugins to analyze the code. Sorry, say it again. Do the macros evaluate to empty when you compile into binary and not uh, running static analysis? Yeah, they don't show up in the binary, yes. Yeah, GCC just ignores them. I'm um, getting to that. Um, so we also have a few other ones. There's uh, override. So in C++, you have these pure virtual methods. But sometimes you actually want to have a full method that is a virtual method that every single child class has, has, has to override. And there's no way to specify that keyword. So we just added an override attribute, too. Um, there's also a sort of must override. There's an, another, another uh, case that comes up when you're refactoring code. So you have this base class, um, say, like a listener interface. And the base class has a bunch of interfaces in it. And say you're re rewriting code and you change the interfaces. Now, you've implemented this uh, listener class somewhere else. And, You've overridden that method, but now that you've changed your interface, that method does, never gets called. It's dead code now. So you can actually specify this method that I just wrote. Uh, make sure that it's actually um, declared virtual in the parent class. And then we have um, a few other things, such as out parameters, where we have, in Mozilla, we pass error, error codes uh, through re return values. And then we actually pass the actual return values as out parameters, as pointers. 
So we have a check that actually synchronizes that every, every time you return a success from your out parameter, uh, from your uh, function, you, you'll, you always set the out parameter. So if you said that you're, you, you've done something successfully, you always set the out parameter. Otherwise, you may point to some un, uh, uninitialized memory. Oh, and there's a stack uh, thing, too, that's very interesting. So the stack uh, property is, was de designed for the garbage collector. Um, in C++, there's no way to say this class should only ever be used on the stack. Um, I think you can't do it in C either. So what happens is you can, you can make the, the, most people say, well, of course you can. You can make the constructor for it private, and then nobody can call a new the, the new method on it because it's private. It, has to, it always has to be um, declared on the heap, on the stack. But it turns out that if you just declare the, the class as a member of another class, then the new operator does not get called. So you have to add, a, you have to add an attribute to make sure that it's not uh, that it's not on the heap. I'll show, I might show an example of this later. So here's a, I'm going to show an actual t actual invocation of this. So I was writing some code for Mozilla, and I just happened to compile it on Solaris, and the Solaris compiler has this warning that it says, hey, this, uh, this variable in your function, it shadows a, uh, a member of your class. And it turned out what happened was I was, um, I was declaring, I accidentally declared that member as a local variable in the function that I was uh, uh, allocating new memory. So I was leaking memory every time I closed, every time I tried to close that pointer. So I'm going to show how that's implemented. I guess it's too small. Oops. I should put it here. Okay. Is this readable at all? Uh, so the idea here is that, um, like I described before, there's a class member, and there's a, and I accidentally declares that that is a local variable when I'm initializing it. So I wanted to implement this warning as a on GCC because neither GCC nor Microsoft Visual C++ has this warning. So I'll show you what the code. So this is the error produced by the warning. So that's the JavaScript for it. Um, you can see that it's fairly short. It's just uh, a couple of nested if statements in a, in a for loop. So I'm going to run this. Can you read this OK or not? Is that a yes or no? OK. How's that? OK. So. This is your normal GCC command line. But in GCC, we've added these new arguments, the f plugin arguments, and f, plug and f uh, plugin arg. So what this does is it loads my plugin over here. 
and everything else is exactly the same. So this means it's really easy to integrate this into your build system. You just modify your C flags, and suddenly you got all these, all these new errors, all these new warnings popping up. This part's not really needed. So I ran it, and sure enough, it produced some errors. So I'm going to focus on the code here. Uh, so we have this method called uh, process function, which which is what, what we use to look at um, look at actual code. We have we we mostly focus on types in Mozilla, but every once in a while you want to look at the actual code in the function. So the, the algorithm here is really simple. You you get this parameter called f. F is the parameter that uh, describes the function you're, you're looking at. So we check if the function is a member of a, of a class, if it's a method. Then if it's not a method, we don't care about it. But if, if, if it is a member of a class, and uh, if one of the variables in that function appears to have the same name as the method, uh, actually, you go, you, go, you go through looking at all the, all the variables in the function, and then you check if, the, if those variables have the same name as a method. So if, if there's a variable that is not a member of another class, and it has the same, the same name as a member, it's an error. And I'll show you what sort of data structures this what I meant by uh, reflect, reflection in JavaScript with JSON. So here, just modified the program to um, What did I do? Oh, I see. Thanks. But as you see, I didn't crash the compiler. It's just that, <laughs> that, that, that was part of the demo. What happened now? Oh. Oh, I see. OK, so this is what I mean by simplified data types that you can always reflect and look at. So every single object in Dehydra is, is, is kept as compact as, and, and, and as possible. So in this case, what I did, I just deleted a couple of the really, really big ones. So that member off, I'll show you a class, and I'll show you all the members, and you'll get like two screens worth of output. So since it's JavaScript, I can just delete, delete any uh, members of an object that I don't want to look at. So here you can see it's a very, it's a so simple JSON-like format. You have you have your, your, all the information in it. So you have the name of the cl the name of the method that you're looking at. You have the the type. You have the parameters, and then you have these funny uh, pound one pound signs, which are which are circular references that JSON doesn't have. So this makes it really easy to, to um, figure out what, what exactly your code looks like in a static analyzer. Instead of just guessing that it must have this property over here, or looking at documentation, you can just print it out to the screen and develop your code that way. So questions about this? Is that a question? Five more minutes. OK, five more I have a, um, a question about the um, uh, reflectivity for our static analysis. Is there any way to actually get that information back um, at uh, runtime, um, somehow linking in the um, extraction of the, um, the class definition back into the application and then sort of ask, asking those sort of questions like, um, given this object, what's its methods? Um, so you mean like to, to make a binding? Yeah. Like a language binding, right? Um, yes. Um, so there's two ways you can do this. The way that we've usually done this is you go through your code and you output a text file with, with, the, with whatever in, the interesting information you've extracted from it. But what you, what you can actually do is we just added the function that actually emits uh, a new linker section with whatever information you want to put in there. So at runtime, you can actually look at the binary that you're running 
and figure out all of the information regarding all the source files in that program. So this is, so far this has only been deployed at Mozilla and a few other smaller deployments here and there. Um, but I think in the future we should have uh, this sort of static analysis integrated into libraries. So when you ship a library, you should be able to specify a number of rules that should never be broken. Um, this will cut down on the really obvious bugs, the really embarrassing kind that, that should never occur. Um, I want to have a distribution wide DXR. So I imagine a day when, when you install Fedora, you look at a piece of code in it, like Apache, and you say, hey, what is this XML function? What, 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 how does it actually work? You click on that XML function and it pulls up the expat source code. And you can navigate navigate backwards and forwards, however you like. Um, I think in, uh, producing these sorts of application-specific static analyses will increase the quality of open source um, software. But at the same time, it would also increase our dependence on GCC, uh, which I think is a good thing, um, because if you increase your dependence on GCC, you're less likely to use the Intel compiler, for example. So you're more likely to put development resources into GCC. Um, and this will actually make, mean that you, so you'll suddenly, you'll be porting your software to Windows and you'll be like, man, I wish I had all these static checks on Windows. So you'll, you know, you'll probably, you'll be more likely to help out GCC with their Windows port. Um, or the Mac port. So, or at the same time, you're hacking on GCC and you, you know, you print out some information in your error and you see the location isn't quite correct. You contribute a patch to GCC and then everybody gets better error messages out of GCC. So everybody wins. It's, that, that's just like, that, that's the, that's the open source world. That, that I want to see, so thank you. Um just briefly, what's your workflow for doing some refactoring? Um so refactoring is difficult. The problem with refactoring is the GCC is, was never designed to do refactoring. So the location information that it gives you is very incomplete. Uh, so, so in the best case, if I went to use GCC and only GCC, I will write an analysis that will produce some warnings or some other way of specifying the things you're looking for. So it will give you a list of locations, and from there you can use you know, Perl or SED to refactor that. That's in the best case. In the worst case, uh, I will go to the, that ELSA parser framework that I, that I might mention, and, and I modify the framework to actually give you exact information, information on every single token in, in your source code. So in that case, you can actually generate the patch based on the input from your static analysis. Um, I have, if you go to my blog, there's a bunch of stories in it from a couple of years ago on, how, on the exact workflow. So a quick question real quick. Uh, on the Dehydra website, uh, the installation instructions are still based on GCC 4.3. Yes. Is there anywhere to find instructions for doing it with 4.5? Um, or 4.4, either one? 4.4 uh, uh, is not really supported. Okay, um, so four, but like 4.5 with, with the stuff, right? So it should, it should mostly work if you just skip the instructions that say pass you GCC installation. Oh, okay, right. Um, but yes, as soon as GCC 4.5 is released, my code already compiles with it. Um, Dehider will work with it. So Treehider still will take some work because Treehider is such a low-level binding and everything has to be generated exactly. And GCC is still changing too much that I, I, every time I fix Treehider, it gets broken again. So right now you'll get Dehider, which is a nice sort of introduction. And in a couple of months, I'll have Treehider ready too. Great. I think that's all we have time for right now. Uh, if you have more questions, uh, possibly Paris will stick around. Yeah, I'll gladly answer any questions or... Um, I have an IRC channel where we will happily guide you through any uh, static analysis troubles. All right, and uh, here you go, Terrace. It's just a little thank you gift for speaking today. Thanks.